I feel that for the fuller life and for the fuller person, the humanities are unbeatable. I think we should try to correct some of the inadequacies in our secondary schools. An important duty facing the teacher is the need to arouse an interest in the students and challenge them more. Basic research is exciting and challenging, but science is not the only thing in life. There are a lot of college students who shouldn't be going to college. Johns Hopkins File 7. Presented by the Johns Hopkins University and the ABC Television Network from Westinghouse Station, WJZ-TV in Baltimore. Here at the famed Johns Hopkins University, we have one file in a long row of files, which in sequence is number seven. This special file contains provocative information about the experiments and ideas which underlie the purpose of our American colleges and universities. Each week we find in this file a story which illustrates how today's scholars contribute to our daily lives and help shape the course of our future, underscoring the fact that all human advancement begins with education. This week, we present The Educational Pursuit with our guests, five outstanding students from the Johns Hopkins University. And here from Johns Hopkins is your host, Lynn Poole. Now, in recent times, particularly in the last 10 months, much has been written, spoken, and discussed about education here in America. We've heard from the scholar, the scientist, and the administrator, and the parent, concerning the needs, the faults, the hopes of our educational system. But what about the students? Well, today, we want to ask the student himself about that educational system. Because every June, the 1,900 colleges and universities throughout the country graduate 600,000 students. Now, these graduates are products of an educational pursuit, a pursuit that has become of great concern to each one of us. Now, it's a rather long and tedious journey from the ringing of a school bell to the receipt of a high school diploma and the eventual attainment of a college degree. Now, it's a pursuit that may begin with a rather carefree attitude, and one that later becomes halfway intense and serious, and finally demands a strict discipline and desire in institutions of higher education. Now, it's from five members of that potential 600,000 June graduate that we hope to gain some insight into the problem of education. These five students are graduating from Johns Hopkins, but they're representative of the thousands of students that are graduating from hundreds of outstanding institutions all over the United States. They know their own experience, and we want to hear from them. Now, someday, an educational system, some say that it's no better than its educators. Now, whether this is an irrational or rational statement, we want to try to find out. And our first guest is a pre-medical student from Fort Dodge, Iowa, Phil Ryerson. This June, Phil expects to receive both his Bachelor of Arts degree and his Master of Arts degree. Phil, how is it possible for you to receive both of these degrees at the same time? Well, Mr. Poole, this is just a matter of wanting to accelerate my own education. I talked to my advisor during my first year at Hopkins and found that it was possible to pr proceed at my own pace. I was allowed to carry more than the usual number of hours during my career and finished my requirements for my A.B. last June. Since last June, I have been working on my master's degree and hope to receive both of these degrees this June. Well, I know, Phil, that uh, you're working in biochemistry at the McCollum Pratt Institute. Uh, do you find the department unique in any manner? Uh, yes. Most of the members of the staff are world-renowned for their work in various fields of biochemistry, and many major contributions have come out of this department. 
They also are willing to sit down and discuss problems with a lowly undergraduate like myself. This means that I am really getting the information right from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Well, you've told me that you're working on a senior project. What is this project and just what does it uh, entail? Well, the senior project is designed to give an individual a chance to do research as an undergraduate. My project is the purification of an enzyme. I work more or less on my own in the laboratory, but I am guided by members of the faculty in my work. If I run up against a stone wall, I am free to go and discuss my problem with the members of the faculty. Well, could you give us more of an idea of exactly what this project is? Uh, in the purification of enzymes, which are proteins which catalyze certain metabolic reactions in the body, we use a certain yeast, which is the main source of the enzyme to be purified. Through various lab techniques of centrifugation, extraction, adsorption on charcoal, salt fractionation, and spectrophotometric assays, we remove as many foreign proteins without getting rid of the enzyme in which we are interested. The hours that I spend working on this project contribute to my degree requirements. Well, being from Iowa, just what were your reasons for coming more than a thousand miles to the university? Well, truthfully, it was Hopkins Medical School, which I first heard of, and then I learned about the Hopkins Undergraduate School. During my sophomore year, I became interested in biochemistry and talked to Dr. McElroy, who suggested that I enroll in a survey course in biochemistry. Since that time, I have developed a real desire in biochemistry and feel that I have learned a good deal of laboratory techniques. Well, following your June graduation, which is June 10th, Phil, what are your future plans? I plan to enter the University of Minnesota Medical School next fall. After two years of medical school, I may decide to return to graduate school to get my doctorate and eventually go into teaching. Well, I think one of the things that uh, <clears throat> interests all of us, because we hear so much about it today, is how did you finance your university education? During my whole undergraduate career, I had a university open scholarship which was awarded to me on the basis of my high school record. Now, I also hold a national research undergraduate scholarship which is offered by the de biology department and the McCollum Pratt Institute for financing undergraduate research. The funds for these scholarships come from the National Science Foundation. Well, being on the verge of graduation, Phil, just what are some of your reflections as you look back on your university career? Well, I graduated from a public high school, and when I entered college, I noticed that many of the boys who had come from prep schools had more special training in their various fields. Also, if I were going into industry right now, I feel I would be somewhat hesitant, and I feel this is only normal. Although, being a science major, I feel that the humanities have definitely contributed to my fuller education. Well, you've mentioned a very important point there. In order to get a closer look at these humanities, let's ask David Seip, an English literature major, just what his reasons were for choosing to pursue the humanities rather than science. Well, of course, Mr. Poole, I can't tell you exactly why it is that I'm more interested in humanities than in science. But I'm certain that we need people in history and literature just as badly as we need trained scientists. What I plan to do after graduation is next fall start work as a graduate student in English literature at Yale. And I hope to be able to teach in a college eventually. Well, what uh, aspects of the curriculum influence you to attend a university such as Hopkins? Actually, I considered a number of universities first. One main thing about Hopkins is very attractive are the number of really distinguished men you have in the humanities, on the faculty, the smallness of most of the classes. I like the way the courses are organized. In history, for example, our studies aren't carefully divided up according to periods and countries. The courses that are taught are those that the professors really think they can handle the best. Well, you told us some of the things that <clears throat> you think are good about it. Uh, do you find certain deficiencies in the curriculum? Well, in most colleges, I think, uh, the study of languages uh, is complicated for language majors by the fact that in their elementary courses, they have to take uh, 
say, French, in conjunction with a number of science students who only want a passable reading knowledge in that particular subject, and often it doesn't work out too well. I think they should be kept separate. It's better for both of them. <laughs> well, do you mind if I ask you a personal question again, as I did Phil Ryerson a moment ago? How did you finance your education? Uh, most of it myself, except for a small scholarship my sophomore year. Now I've received a fellowship which makes it possible for me to go to graduate school next year. Looking back, <clears throat> looking back over your entire life as a student, <clears throat> beginning with your high school, do you feel that the high school prepared you well for college or do you find certain deficiencies there? Well, I'm afraid there are a lot of students in college now that shouldn't be there. And if high school diplomas really meant more, a lot of these people wouldn't feel that they had to go to college. Of course, we're going to have a terrific time trying to correct the situation because our whole attitude is wrong uh, as to just what the function of high school education should be because we simply don't expect enough of ourselves. Well, I'm sure we can agree that our American high schools have done an outstanding job through these years, but like all educational institutions, we've got to make some changes. Would you suggest that we ought to adopt the European edu educational plan of funneling out the students that shouldn't go to college and making it possible for more of those uh, superior students to go on to universities? My main criticism of this plan uh, is simply that it's very complicated to try to discover from a series of tests how well a student is going to be able to do in college. A better idea might be to arrange high school courses in such a way that a student who is very good in a certain subject, like physics, is not placed in the same class with students that aren't quite so good at in it. And this way, the whole funneling out system is much more gradual and probably fairer. Well, I think uh, there are many people today uh, that are agreeing with you that in high school we should place superior students in one course together average students in another course together so that they can work at their own pace. Uh, this is being very much discussed and I think it would follow along with some of the ideas that you have. Going back to your high school, you worked there, you came on to college, you found it a little tougher mm -hmm. when you got to the, uh, the university. Uh, it's going to be tougher in graduate school. Do you have any hesitancy about going on to graduate work? Well, naturally, I certainly do because it's a very difficult and insecure type of life. Actually, I've always wanted to make my living in the humanities in spite of the fact that so many of the courses in history and literature in high school are poorly taught or attended by students that aren't really interested in what is going on. In order to find the right kind of situation in these courses, you have to go to college, and even then you have to be extremely careful which college it is that you go to. If I might refer to some of the things that you've said I think you have pointed out something very important, and that is that at the high school level, we've got to stimulate uh, students more. I certainly do. Uh, and to make them realize that education is something that you have to work at. It's that it's not, not just anything. easy. And that new things have to come along, and one new thing came along here a year ago. A new teacher training program experiment began at Johns Hopkins. Twenty full tuition scholarships were awarded to college and university graduates not qualified for teaching when they received their Bachelor of Arts degree. Now this program it is to be financed for three years by a $275,000 grant from the Fund for the Advancement of Education. Its purpose is to get a greater number of high quality teachers into secondary teaching. Now this June, June 10th, the first group of teachers from this program at Johns Hopkins will be graduating. And one of the outstanding members of that graduating class will be Miss Allison First of Freeport, Illinois. Allison, just what are the specific aims of the teacher training program that you're involved in at the moment? I believe that it is aimed at <clears throat> more efficient use of, of qualified personnel in the classroom and designed to be realistic, experimental, and intellectually stimulating. Well, first, let's get a little background on Miss First. Uh, prior to entering this program. What is your educational background? Well, I went to a small town public high school in Freeport, Illinois. I then attended Wellesley College for four years and received my A.B. in history last June. Well, at this point, you're apparently not qualified to teach in secondary school. No, I wasn't. 
I'd thought of becoming a teacher for a good portion of my life, and had had the idea in the back of my head of going to graduate school. I did not want to concentrate on teaching in my undergraduate work, but instead wanted a good, solid liberal arts background. I had heard of the teacher training program at Harvard, and when Hopkins sent out applications for a similar program, I applied and was awarded one of the scholarships. Well, just what is the attraction of uh, this program, and how does it prepare you for teaching in secondary schools? Well, there's the feature of doing graduate work in my own field while learning to be a teacher, and the actual internship while receiving my master's degree, and also the freedom which the program offers me in handling my own class. It's a very intense program. Last summer, we started out with a six-week session, which included courses in educational psychology, observation, and principles and methods of secondary teaching. Then last fall, I entered a full academic year, which included an internship of one semester in the Baltimore County Schools, for which I was paid a long-term substitute teacher's pay of $1,675. I also took courses in history and participated in a seminar with all the other members of the program. Well, as you near the completion of this uh, program, how do you feel that you're actually going to be qualified to go out and teach young people in secondary schools? Well, I feel the program has stressed the more practical aspects of teaching. Also, it has given me a broader outlook on education, and I think it will enable me to challenge my students more. It has given me a great deal of independence in the classroom, too. And, of course, there are the intangibles involved in my work. I feel that teaching allows a person to deal directly with people. Basic to all of it is my love of teaching and history. Well, when you finish this program and receive your degree and you can become a teacher, what factors are going to influence your selection of a job? Well, first of all, the location. And secondly, the courses that I'm asked to teach. I would prefer history. And thirdly, of course, the salary. The major decision which I have to make is whether to teach in a private or a public school. Well, that brings us up to the question... Uh, you attended a public high school in the Middle West. You came east to a private school, a woman's college, and you're now take, taking this uh, program. Uh, what are your thoughts about the susceptibility of present-day students to teaching? Do they want to learn? I feel it's about the same as when I was a student. Naturally, if a student is interested, he will be susceptible to teaching. I don't feel that uh, the receptiveness of students has been a recent change. Their attitude definitely does not lay value on becoming a top student. We have to arouse an interest in the students and to challenge them more. And I feel our program and others like it is the first step in that direction. Well, Miss, <clears throat> first, I'm sure that you're going to find exactly the job you want, where you want it, because you have an approach to this that is very important with the secondary school teacher. That is that she be given an opportunity to teach the thing that she enjoys most, that she, about which she knows the most, and through this be able to stimulate young people to want to learn. And that's the important thing today. Now we have with us today the two, two electrical engineering students, uh, James Laurie and Marvin Garbus. Both are receiving their Bachelor of Science degrees in June, and both are at the top of their engineering class. Marv, uh, just what are your plans following graduation? Well, Mr. Poole, I plan to go into industry and take part-time graduate work while I'm working out there. Perhaps I made this choice because of my undergraduate program, which, as you know, was the cooperative plan. On this plan, I also worked while I was going to school, and this gave me the advantage of a double education. And I feel that in postgraduate work, I should also like this double education. Well, whether it be industry or an advanced degree, I think that our viewers would like to know why both of you gentlemen chose engineering as a field. Well, if I may speak again, I chose engineering because I feel that my interest in science is there, and I want to be in the applied end of science, and I want to use these things which are thought of up in the ivory towers. Although right now, engineers are doing a lot of things which I consider distasteful, designing more terrible weapons of war, I think eventually the guided missiles will carry more pleasant messages than they do now. I don't think mail is out of the question. <laughs> uh, I've always been interested in uh, scientific and technical material. Uh, 
the present time, I'm probably most interested in computers. I think these have a very large peacetime use, and they pose a great many uh, very interesting problems, both on the fundamental and the applied level. Well, we've talked about the importance of teachers, how she can guide her student in the secondary school. Let's come to the college level. Does the teacher there have, as the professor, have as much influence on the individual student in, in guiding and stimulating him? Well, the uh, largest uh, factor in my guidance and stimulation, as far as I was concerned, I received uh, while working on an ARDC project this summer under Dr. William Huggins of the university. Uh, you, you can't really grasp the value of advanced knowledge until you have worked on such a project. Uh, I was acted chiefly as a technician building some of the instrumentation for the project, and I was very much interested in, I was very much influenced by Dr. Huggins, by his devotion to his work, and by his advanced knowledge in the field. I also was influenced by Dr. Huggins. I was not fortunate enough to take a course with the man, but I did work with him in forming a chapter of Ada Kappa Nu, National Electrical Engineers Honorary at Johns Hopkins. However, the person who most uh, and advised me was my advisor, of course, Dr. Hamburger. Dr. Hamburger is head of the department, and yet he finds the time to take a real personal interest in every one of his students. And his experience is so wide, ranging from the head of a research division to a courtmaster in patent disputes, that he could advise me in every facet of engineering. Well, you both seem to agree with me that the teacher has one of the greatest influences on young people, therefore one of the great influences in this entire country. Marv, how do you feel about teaching? I feel, Mr. Poole, that I, myself, would be best on the production end rather than the instruction end of engineering. Perhaps Jim has different ideas. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to get a master's degree, a uh, master's fellowship, which will permit me to do a little uh, teaching next year. I hope to expand these teaching duties. And uh, I feel in this way I can get uh, a greater knowledge of uh, whether I will be a good teacher. Well, I think you probably have to follow your bent. You have to decide whether you're going into industry or whether you're going into teaching because we need, we need teachers. Uh, tell us this. I think our audience uh, would be very much interested in knowing how you feel about the academic process, the curriculum that you have all been going through. Well, I personally would have liked to have seen more uh, technical engineering and basic science courses in the curriculum, even if necessary at the expense of a few of the humanities. Uh, I think it would have made me a little uh, more self-confident were I going into this industry. I disagree entirely with you, Jim. I think we need more humanities in the engineering program. The engineer is a human being, and he must be the fullest possible person. And I think the more humanities which are in there, the more full the person can be. Well, I feel that I don't quite agree with you, Mark. I feel that uh, the humanities are leisure time oriented, basically. Uh, they require a good deal of motivation and interest in them uh, before the student can get anything from them. And if you make them required, then uh, perhaps you're defeating yourself. Motivation and interest. Well, you're motivated and interested in your engineering courses, Jim, or you wouldn't be a senior by now. And I'm just as interested in my humanities as I am in my engineering courses. And I think the ideal program is one which incorporates a great deal of humanities in the engineering curriculum. Well, here again, you make humanities a required part of the curriculum, and what do you do? The student simply says, well, here, I've got to take these. There's no way out of it. Well, I'll take the ones that are easiest and the ones that happen to fit in my schedule. Now, you can't, you can't really get anything from something like this. If a student is interested and motivated, he'll probably pick it up somewhere outside. Well, perhaps, Jim, but if I had it to do over again, and if I were a college administrator, I would set up a program similar to the one which involves Western Maryland and Johns Hopkins right now. There, a student takes three years of liberal arts at Western Maryland and transfers to Hopkins for two years of engineering. Thus, he becomes a fully well-rounded person. Well, you gentlemen have gotten into a, <laughs> a pretty big field here, one that's been argued back and forth for a long time. Uh, we're not going to solve it here today, but can I put in my word on it? Certainly. <laughs> well, I think we've got 
with the engineering student and the science student, we've got to give him the background of as much humanities as we possibly can. Because for the rest of your life, when you go out and pursue your engineering career, this is your work, it's your intense interest, but you've got to have other things to, to fall back on. I agree with you. For your later time. Let me ask you one more question here. Uh, do you think there are things lacking in today's engineering curriculum? Well, as I have said before, uh, I would have liked to have seen a few more design courses to, in, in, to give the, the incoming student more of a, a feel for his life's work. Well, I feel that since I've been receiving design courses in industry, I, I feel that the design course in school could not possibly be specialized enough, uh, could be specialized enough for one person, but not for the guy next to him. And I feel that the broad theoretical courses are the kind which are best, and the humanities are even better. Well, everyone doesn't have this opportunity to, t to be in industry simultaneously. Yes, well, you both, you both of you have had an experience <clears throat> in working with industrial projects, working on research projects, and getting your undergraduate education at the same time, but you have both pointed out the fact that if you're going to progress in your field, you must go on to some sort of advanced education. And both of these gentlemen and the other three that have been on our <clears throat> program today have given us comments about training and working in an undergraduate school. There are five representatives of the thousands of young people that are going to graduate from colleges and universities today. This spring, these young people of tomorrow are going out. They speak for their friends all over the country. And we hope that you're going to join us next week when we look at how various American foundations help support education in America. But before we do that, I wonder if we might just stop for a minute and think about all of these thousands of students all over the entire United States that sometime this June are going to walk up and into their hands is going to be placed a diploma something like this. As we said in the beginning, we've heard from the scientists, the scholars, the technicians. We've read about their ideas in the newspapers. Today we've had a chance to explore with the young people who are going to receive this diploma. Their thoughts are very important because they're the ones that are taking this training now are going on to more training in the future. We must listen to them, find out what they think, and then follow them in the next few years. So we hope that you will be with us next week when we present something also important in American education, Foundations for Ideas. Johns Hopkins File 7 originates from the studios of WJZ-TV in Baltimore, Maryland. This is the ABC Television Network.